Welcome to State of Reform's Virtual Leadership Series with some of healthcare's most thoughtful leaders. And now the host of State of Reform, DJ Wilson. Aloha and another welcome to another edition of our leadership series, one of our virtual conversations we're hosting here during this time of COVID. It's clear we don't all want to get back into a large room with a few hundred of our closest friends anytime soon, but the issues that we face in healthcare are even more acute, of course, today in this time than ever. So getting ourselves around community and wrestling some of those issues to the ground is uh, uh, as needed as ever. We're going to jump in here in a minute with Lieutenant Governor Josh Green, but I want to first just orient you a little bit to what you see on your site here. Of course, you've got our screen here on on the left side of your screen. Uh, On the right, really near the middle of the screen is a QA and a section where you can offer your questions and uh, pipe in with comments that you might want to share with Lieutenant Governor Josh Green, and I'll do my best to integrate those. You can upvote those if you see somebody and someone's comment that you like and you want to further prioritize. That way I know which comments I should focus on from you all watching. We have over 200, uh, 200 participants with us in this conversation today, so it's a, it's a good crowd to talk about uh, what Lieutenant Governor Josh Green is doing in terms of his leadership on COVID and in the state of Hawaii in general. So without further ado, let's just jump right into it. Uh, Lieutenant Governor, thank you very much for making time to be with us. Thank you, DJ. Good. Call me Josh, of course, as ever. And uh, it's really a pleasure to be with, with everyone. Uh, we've had some interesting experiences here, and I, I'm looking forward to sharing. Yeah, good good stuff. I, I want to start just with a, a little bit of a political science geek thing, uh, which I know uh, you can appreciate, at least the political science part, maybe not the geek part. But uh, there are not a lot of lieutenant governors in America who are as hands-on and who have uh, been at the forefront of issues in their state, not nearly as many as uh, as you have been. Um, talk to me just about sort of maybe what you thought this position was going to be when you first started thinking about running for it a couple of years ago and what it has become now uh, as you're part of a, a broader team working with a lot of different voices to navigate the state through this pandemic. Sure. So I've been in office for about a year and a half now. When I first uh, decided to run it because I'm a I'm a full time doctor. Otherwise, I thought it would be a way that I could um, just contribute with a broader voice and have a statewide influence. But it being support of the governor, and I expected to really learn a lot from these four years and and get to know some of the larger questions, whether they're environmental or or health, which I'm very familiar with, and so on. What really happened was we ran into a buzzsaw on homelessness and then uh, the COVID crisis. And so I decided just to be as as operationally active as humanly possible. And this year, I mean, just as fate would have it, we ended up with a global pandemic and my background in healthcare has helped. So, I, or I think it's helped. So I'm working as the point person essentially for the governor's team to do a lot of the, the, the heavy lift on COVID. They have to make all the final decisions as governors do for for their states, but uh, we were able to um, assess many different challenges that were coming our way on COVID. And so uh, it's been very gratifying to be a part of the full team. A lot of times, a lot of times, Lieutenant Governors are considered second tier, just waiting in case. And that didn't end up being the case here. Really, we dove in. So we were able to help them make the call on uh, shutting down the state, having uh, cruise ships not come to the state of Hawaii, which was a, a large question and problem for us because of spread. The ultimate uh, question about testing and being able to advise them from a healthcare perspective, not so much as a, a politician, but as a physician, what really that would require to test people to get the the data we needed to make big policy questions. Our governor decided to quarantine uh, the whole state and stop flights here, essentially. 14 day quarantine. So it dropped our travel by 99.6%. These are big questions and they were driven by data and driven by medical science. So that's been my experience as Lieutenant Governor. Uh, So it's like 18 hours a day. I I stepped off of a a leadership call to be with you right now as we're finalizing the state's policy on reopening. And I can share maybe a little bit about that here in a a few moments. Uh, That'll be big breaking news tomorrow, presumably. Well, that's, I, I know we were um, 
carving out time and you were juggling a number of priorities. I really appreciate that you've made uh, made an effort to include us in your calendar. Why don't you walk us through at least some of the considerations? I re recognize most of that news needs to be broken tomorrow, uh, but walk us through some of the considerations that you guys are weighing, the questions that you're trying to consider and the, the, the interests that you're balancing as you try to move the state towards reopening. Sure. So a lot of it is uh, familiar to many on the call, I'm sure. Uh, just by way of a uh, brief overview, the state of Hawaii, tiny state, uh, 1.4 million people. However, historically, we've had 10 million travelers a year. So our population is magnified very greatly by the people that come. And, and as we all know, we love to have travelers. Uh, we have visitors constantly. We get them from the mainland and we get lots and lots of travelers from Japan, China, Korea, and so on. Australia, New Zealand. So we had challenges from both directions. And depending on where the COVID surge was, that's something we had to be mindful of. We to date have had 819 positive cases, which is a very small number. I mean, some of your states have 819 cases in a day. Uh, we've had 819 total. We've tested 70,000 people, which represents about 5% of our population. And 1.16% 1, 1 of the people that have been tested have turned up positive for us. We've had only a small outbreak one time so far of a meaningful number in a nursing home, 15 people, which I know is very scary. And, and obviously with mortality rate being very high for seniors uh, over 80 and over 75, it's a big challenge. So we've been lucky to keep the numbers down very significantly because of the 14-day quarantine order, which most people adhere to. Also, we had a um, order to stay at home for a significant amount of time until just about a month ago. So we really shut it down. So what's that meant? Well, it meant that our numbers stayed down. We have the lowest mortality rate in the nation. We have had 17 fatalities total. Uh, that's 1.2 per 100,000. So that's it's the lowest number, even when you consider like Montana, Montana, Wyoming, we're very close also, and, and to other states that are very rural. So a very low mortality rate. We realized if we hadn't shut down, the projections were terrible. Uh, we would have had 4,479 projected deaths because we have a very limited healthcare system. I think we've talked about that before. We have like 459 uh, ventil ventilators uh, total in our state, total. So we have, if we had a surge, a bad surge, we wouldn't be able to handle it. So we've had to be super mindful of that. And so where does that bring us? Well, by shutting it down completely, and we're a state that depends on tourism, we've had on the one hand, thank goodness, an extraordinary public health response where very few people have died and very little spreads occurred. But on the other hand, we've had incredible economic consequences. So our, our uh, unemployment number is 22.3%. It's 36% on Maui because we depend so completely on travel and tourism. So because of that, we're now wrestling with the next phase. So it's phase one. If you're going to say something went well, I guess you could say phase one went very well. Uh, but phase two now, as we plan to reopen the state, is a bit daunting because people, as you can imagine, are very nervous. They know what our numbers have been. We, Even on our worst days, we get like 20 cases. We've often had seven, eight cases or three cases, three cases today. Um, but when we open to mainland travel, people are worried what will happen. What will happen when New Yorkers like my relatives fly in? They don't listen to me ever, you know, or Californians who have had a surge or if we have travelers from Asia, what will the case be? So we have had to set aside political differences that we have internally in the state and determine the best course. So we're gonna do the following. Uh, at the airport, we're gonna do the obvious, right? We're going to get good data and contact data so that we can always trace and track individuals if we need to, if they're sick. We will do uh, thermal screen. We're spending $36 million on thermal screeners, which have limited value, but they do send a psychological message and they may decrease by 15 or 20% the number of cases we'd miss. We'll take temperatures comprehensively, and then we are going to have a test, a, a pre-arrival test. And it would be good actually, if your leadership, um, DJ, were to share this because you'll see it in the news and I'll do a lot of um, media on this, I, I assume, after we announce it. But the idea of having a pre-test, PCR test, we're entering into an agreement with CVS and others uh, nationally where they can do many tests. There's 1,400 places that CVS has across the country. They do a pre-test uh, 72 hours prior to travel to Hawaii. That will decrease, we believe, by 70% the number of cases that would otherwise travel here. 
we've analyzed the Alaska uh, plan. We've talked to Ann Fink, who's their director of health or chief medical officer. And we have data from them already. Very interesting data you might be, in, you might be uh, interested in me sharing. And we can see how many people are asymptomatic carriers as travelers. We can see where their travel patterns have been and where they're at highest risk. And we can know what mitigating factors we uh, have to put into place here to keep our numbers low. And by doing that, by applying the test, having people pay for a test in advance, and I do apologize for that, uh, we expect to be able to keep numbers very low in Hawaii and also maintain Hawaii's status as a very safe place with low rates so people can have a better experience if they come back. And I will finish on this note. It's not just about keeping the numbers down. It's keeping the numbers down because we already have very low numbers. And you can imagine what the impact of suddenly leaping up as we open the state. It could create quite a, um, a lot of conflict between our local residents and travelers. And we don't want that. We want to embrace people in kind of our, our current uh, spirit of aloha. So we want to make sure we have a seamless process to bring people back. And I believe that with all of those um, layers of protection, we will not see a large surge in Hawaii. I, I think we will keep our numbers very low and it will probably benefit us long-term because it will maintain the reputation of Hawaii. Yeah, good stuff. That's, uh, that's a lot. Um, Stephen Hurlbert asks just about these pretests and how do you ensure that the documentation is real? There are also sort of questions just about managing data and transmitting data and uh, particularly if some of these pretests or all of the pretests are happening on the mainland or outside of Hawaii, how, how are you leaving that to CVS to manage a significant part of that? Or how does that data management piece look? Brilliant question. So that's costing us 20 bucks a pop. So CVS is giving us a rate of $140 per test, may come down a little bit, and we will pay additionally a $20 admin fee for which they will have a call center. They'll have uh, tech follow up. We we get an average. The test time averages 2.1 days to get a test done. We'll have other partners as well if they'd like to join us. But CVS has got the most um, broad, mo the the greatest breadth of coverage of the United States. We've also reached out to Kaiser in the last 24 hours because Kaiser may very well want to also test at least their patients or people before traveling. So lots and lots of. Uh, technical challenges. We will have a digital system where people will just fill out their uh, travel health form before they come here. They'll designate on the form that they were tested and it was negative. And in the first weeks, we expect them to just show us their negative test. Now, the, the truth is, okay, let's talk about fraud. So someone's flying to Hawaii, maybe, or, or another state that requires this, like Alaska, or now Maine has some, has some criteria, Tahiti, other places. One thing is if anyone violates any of these rules, they could be subject to fine, though we're not doing a lot of enforcement like that, not, not overly enforcing it, but the fine is up to $5,000 in a year in jail. So we will put that on the form, please you know, be honest. Only one out of 300 to 400 people are, are positive for COVID and traveling, okay? That's, the, that's a, a safe premise. It can be a little higher in some places, a little lower. And so if you have that number, about one out of 300, it was one out of 376 going into Alaska. And then you figure maybe one out of 200 people just decide they're going to cheat the form, just decide they're not going to do it or they're going to try to sneak through somehow. Once you start looking at the actual risk, it becomes something like one out of 60,000 individuals will both cheat and be positive. And we don't like any of that, but you can imagine that's such a, that's a sufficiently low number. We're only expecting to get between 10 and 15,000 travelers per day. That's about half of what we normally get. So we can handle that number of people coming through. It's all about uh, having a filter and having just a numeric understanding of where we'll go. You know, most people would kill to have only, you know, two or three people coming to the state. That's like walking into Costco in most places in the country. You're probably <laughs> walking around with two or three people. And we're talking about limiting that number into the state. Nadine Sal asks about uh, the inter-island inter travel and schools reopening maybe in the fall or uh, what schools in the fall in general might look like uh, yeah. as we reopen. Share some thoughts on inter island travel and schools reopen or taking kids back into the classroom come fall. Well, a lot of this is um, being coordinated right now with some of the meeting I was having earlier today. So, okay, first inter island travel. We lifted the inter island travel uh, ban restriction, which required quarantine on uh, the 16th, a week ago today, I believe, yes. 
And so now people just to fill out a form and they don't know, they no longer need to have quarantine in between islands. I always thought that that was probably overkill anyway, because we had utterly low rates and we weren't seeing a lot of movement of the virus anywhere. So we had zero to five cases for 30 consecutive days. Uh, so that's lifted. So we don't have to worry about that. And that's important because we need people to get healthcare, honestly. And between the islands, a lot of people travel for healthcare. Now on schools, the schools are set to open the, the early days of August. The proposal right now that's being talked about is half days for the first two weeks as they expand uh, all the questions to all the families. Where do you want your child to be educated? Do you want them to be in the facility or do you want to have them do some learning from a distance, some, uh, you know, some learning online and so on? So the expectation is that young students, probably up to the third grade, will all be in school because if you don't have them in school five days a week, you really disadvantage parents that have to work otherwise. And also, we've in general, in general, we've had a low risk with young people. Although I do wonder about the numbers. I don't think we've tested a lot of children across the country, so we're not exactly sure how many are asymptomatic uh, carriers of COVID. The older children will be given more opportunity to uh, do distance learning for a time. Uh, the other question is masks. We don't have the capacity in our public schools to distance young people sufficiently. So there's talk about staggering their schedules. A lot of this is still being debated by the superintendent of schools. I will tell you this, I had two very different experiences with my children. One's in a charter school, public school. He only got about one hour of education a day. Wonderful school, but they just didn't have capacity for a lot of the other kids. And so we did a lot of the education at home. My wife's an, uh, an attorney, but uh, does it from home, uh, Jamie. Now, the, the prep school that Maya goes to, Iolani, it was shocking. They never missed a beat. It was seven and a half or eight hours of school a day. They even had her ballet classes online, so she was able to, to not miss a beat. I think her education may have even been better than it normally has been in the classroom because there was less distraction for her and they really, they worked it hard. So we're trying to have our public schools meet that standard and without the same kind of resources, it's hard of course, but they are working on getting tech to everybody, uh, not unlike they're doing in Los Angeles and other places. Elton Leslie has a question about the possible increase in mental health concerns, particularly in the in the neighboring islands. Uh, he asked specifically about the Big Island and also wondering about how the state might provide funding or administrative uh, relief in some, some measure to facilitate a response for this looming mental health wave uh, of issues that we, we know is coming. What are your thoughts on, on how the state can address mental health concerns? I'm really concerned because uh, we already were struggling to convince our leadership and, and funding behavioral health has been a priority of mine for a long time, as we've talked about, especially for those who are uh, suffering through poverty. And so we were already struggling to adequately fund those programs and to bring neighbor island providers uh, enough resources to stay in business. And now we're going to not only have a surge probably of 15 to 20 percent in Medicaid, which is a, a large cost. But a lot of the programs are being debated right now at the legislature, which things they think that they can fund, because we're going to have essentially a $1 billion shortfall. The goal at the present is to fully fund all operations and as many contracts as possible, maybe all of them, by borrowing a $1 billion from the federal government, paying it back over three years, which is the rules at 1% um, for the federal loan program. That obviously negates a lot of the ambitious programs that we had hoped to do, which were add-ons to the current um, baseline of inadequate medical health services and especially mental health on neighbor islands. I think there'll be a lot of ad added capacity for telehealth that will be funded. It will be reimbursed. I don't know if that's a sufficient answer, but I do know that it will be much more available than ever before. I also think that the hospitals are going to be subsidized completely to hire uh, healthcare professionals to keep them alive and, and afloat because they saw a great, great decreases in their uh, earnings this year, just because the volumes were less than half uh, based on, you know, all the projections we have for the last three months. It's going to be lean. And I think that we will see that that's one of the big casualty areas that we've had a higher suicide rate for sure. We saw a very large surge on Kauai, I'm told. We you know, we worry that people didn't have services to get admitted to before and our hospitals, none of them closed, which is a very good thing. 
but we do think that some healthcare providers are going to probably close up shop and maybe even go to the mainland because more than half of them suffered very significant declines in revenue. Uh, so we'll probably be doing cleanup for two years would be my guess. Uh, but telepsych is going to be a big deal for us. So maybe talk a little bit about how the healthcare community has been working on this. I know uh, working on this reopening and working as partners, Laura Hawkins uh, asks specifically about how they're collaborating with one another. But I'm also wondering about how you have found the interaction uh, with folks like President and CEO of HMSA, Mark Magushi, and, and Ray Vara at uh, Hawaii Pacific Health. They've been key leaders on the reopening committee, leading it in the case of uh, uh, Dr. Yes. Magushi. So uh, talk about how healthcare organizations have been working with the state in this process and how they've been sort of collaborating amongst themselves. Well, it's really fascinating to watch because I'm, I'm close to both um, Ray Barry and Mark Mugishi. So from the standpoint of overall public policy, they've been right in the thick of it because COVID policy is health policy, which is even tourism policy all at once. So they've been making sure that we have the capacity to all of our facilities to stay open and be ready in case we have any surges. We've maintained our healthcare uh, utilization patterns. Well, between 10 and 15% of our ventilators have been used that's been very tight. Uh, about 45% of our ICU beds have been filled and 55% of our hospital beds have been filled, plus or minus say 3%. So we're ready and we've prepared ourselves to be ready to reopen. Now, as to just general healthcare, it was interesting because we had this debate, which was fairly caustic over the last two years, three years, about, for instance, payment transformation and payment reform. But ironically, because of payment transformation, most of the primary care providers in the state of Hawaii continued to collect the same rate of monies that they were getting for the last two years, even though they were only seeing like 40% or less the number of patients. And I'm not here to make a special pitch for payment transformation one way or another, but it turns out they may have had a minor crystal ball because had it not gone that way, we could have seen decreases in revenues by 80 or 90% for a lot of practices when they just had to straight up close for two months and do very, very little except a little telehealth. So a lot of them will find themselves in better shape as a, excuse me, as a result of the process. Uh, the other things that we are seeing is that we've needed these guys as health leaders, but also as business leaders to motivate our, our leadership here at the fifth floor, governor, myself and others to actually be thoughtful about reopening because had we not if we didn't reopen or we don't reopen in August, we're going to go off a cliff. I mean, people think that the mental health problems have been bad so far. Wait until people start going actually bankrupt or actually have to pull their children out of the schools that they like or lose their life savings. So, so far, it's been three and a half rough months with a lot of subsidy to keep people afloat with you know, federal unemployment, state unemployment and subsidies. Uh, we have not had to close any major corporations, any large employers yet. Small businesses are hurting. There's no question. But all of that has been with minimal negative effect. Uh, there have been some heartbreak stories along the way, but they're few and far between. Yeah, it's, uh, boy, thinking about August and, and you say the the tough days ahead. I'm reminded of this document that came out of the, the Washington State Department of Health. You talked about the Alaska state numbers. Washington State uh, Department of Health talked about this is these days that we're in now in May and June are the, the honeymoon period, that these are the best days we'll have for 12 to 18, maybe 24 months in terms of mental health, that as we get back, start, you know, start getting into the fall and and uh, start getting back into the schools, uh, and we don't have vaccines starting to appear anytime soon, things are going to get rough. Um, what are your thoughts just as you think about vaccines? I know you're not in the biotech industry, and you know, uh, yeah. I get all that, but just give us some insight as a physician, as a sort of somebody who has to be looking forward on behalf of his community. When do you think we're going to be through all of this? Well, vaccine, I think is going to, I'm going to give you a prediction. I'll give you a political prediction and then I'll give you a realistic prediction. Mm -hmm. I think realistically, we're not going to get a meaningful vaccine until next May. I, however, will bet you a dollar that um, the federal government floats an initial vaccination mid-October mid and right before the election. I, I just have a strange feeling that that's going to become part of the, the crazy narrative that exists in this presidential election. 
And I hope that we assess the science of that very carefully because you can't really get a vaccination ready in a year or nine months. It just does not happen. Um, but we did have some advanced work that was being done, of course, by uh, Oxford and others on, on coronaviruses, which is very good. And my old university uh, where I did my residency, Pitt, um, University of Pittsburgh, has done some advanced work. So it would be fantastic. That would be incredible. I expect, though, that we're going to have to roll right through the fall and winter, and then we'll start seeing two or three different companies uh, lay out vaccinations, which will be necessary because we believe right now in our state that we're probably only like less than 1% of people with antibodies. So we're completely prone still. We have had so little cases, so few cases that um, it'll just be an explosion of COVID if we don't you know, keep it at bay. So we yeah. have to, more than any other state, have a vaccination. And then yeah. as I was going to actually comment on other vaccinations, I think we're going to have to catch up just as healthcare communities catch up on our regular vaccinations or people are going to start seeing outbreaks of meningitis or um, pneumonia, like you can't believe. So having gone through the Samoa experience, which we all watched where they had a gap of, I think it was like two years where they didn't vaccinate anybody because of a crisis, the whole world could face that. And we saw measles outbreaks. So I think that you are right when you say that we're we have a roller coaster ahead. It may not just be mental health care. It could be other different chronic diseases. We started a free clinic. We took care of two people that had heart attacks and hadn't gone to the ER. And they just they just wrote it out. One of them was in heart failure. The other was doing okay. Uh, so there's many, many uh, situations now that are a result of people not getting health care and not getting regular you know, checkups and so on. Well, I know we are out of time with you today, Josh. I hope uh, maybe we can get back on your calendar in three or four months and see where we are as the fall starts. And I will just say people who know me know I've said this. If they've attended one of our state reform conferences, they know I've said this. We cover uh, nine states pretty actively. And of course, we're paying attention to even more. And there are a few state executive leaders uh, as good at their job, particularly in the healthcare space as you are. So Mr. Lieutenant Governor, thank you for making time. For those of you who are watching, we will have this online and available for you to share with your friends. And I wanna make sure that you have an opportunity to uh, give us feedback. Uh, we'll send out a, a link for your survey questions and love to hear what you have to say. Josh, did you wanna have a final word there before we, we sign off? Well, I just wanted to thank you. You know, look, we can test up to 5,000 people a day. We have 160 contact tracers coming aboard. We want to open the state of Hawaii up. And so from my perspective, if people are out there from across the country, plan on getting a test a couple of days before, and then we'll be welcoming you back. So we are, we're ready, health and safety are gonna come first, but we will reopen our state and we'll do it uh, intelligently, I hope. So uh, I look forward to seeing everybody and just thanks for fighting the fight on healthcare and yeah, healthcare appreciate policy. It. Mahalo for your time, Josh, and, and thank you for your time for all of those who are watching this. Appreciate it. And we'll have more in this leadership series and our Hawaii Five Slides. If you missed our recent Five Slides uh, conversation with Dr. Mugishi, Ray Vara, and Mary Bolin from the university, that is online at statereform.com. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining us in this virtual conversation and for your support of our work at State of Reform. 